welcome to CIO News. I am Kushpa Soni, your host for today on our series on energizing a digital future. This is an exclusive fireside chat powered by Creon Software Experts with our digital innovators of India. This is a recorded session and will be available on our website, which is cionews.co.in and our CIO News LinkedIn handle. A quick brief about our presenting partner, Creon. Uh, Creon helps customers build the commercial and technical foundation for a successful and a secure digital transformation journey. Creon provides guidance on the best solutions to organizations for their business needs and budget to thrive and innovate with software, cloud, AI, and big data. Let me dive in introducing our guest for today. Uh, we have Mr. Vinod Raju, the head IT at Expo Freight Limited. Vinod is a technology leader with over 28 years of rich experience in varied areas of IT, ranging from heading the IT division in the logistics multinational companies to software application design and development and IT infrastructure management companies. Prior to Expo Freight, Vinod has worked for organizations like Daxor India and AFL Group. Welcome, Vinod. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Along with me today, we have Mr. Vikas Bosley, the Chief Executive Officer at Creon Software Exports and our moderator for the interview. Vikas has 25 years of progressive business experience with an expertise on sales, marketing, strategy, operations management in the field of IT. Welcome, Vikas. Thank you, Kushbu. As usual, very, very generous and uh, Welcome, Vinod. Uh, very nice to have you in our next uh, chapter on uh, digital innovators in our country. Right. Uh, uh, so, welcome Thank again. You. Thank you. So I, I like to start the discussion uh, by letting our listeners know a little bit more about uh, Expo Freights Limited. So, Expo is a 25 year old, will be 25 very soon, 25 year old uh, forwarding and a supply chain. Uh, headquartered in Colombo, with a presence in over 25 countries. And uh, we are primarily, uh, as part of the supply chain, we are primarily into forwarding, clearance, and uh, we are now getting, uh, expanding our, uh, expanding our business into uh, warehousing. So that, that's where we are going now. So that's basically what we do. We are, well, if I can, Brag a bit, we're in the top 50 uh, 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 freight forwarders in the ocean freight across the, the entire world globally, and about uh, the top 25 in air freight globally. Yeah. Yes, uh, wonderful. So, I, uh, so you are into ocean freight, land freight, multimodal transport, now doing warehousing. Uh, if I know this space well, we know it's an extremely crowded space with so many players they are doing uh, different things there are of course the bigger players and then there are those mom and pop shops that you see across you know ports or airports and things like that so you know it's an extremely competitive space profit margins are really challenged and when you really look at you know this entire supply chain business I would say that technology could be one of the things that create a big differentiators for such organizations to cut away from the from the pack, so to say, and carve a niche for themselves. So, as a technology leader in Expo Freights, looking at the industry that you are in, how do you ensure that your technology is getting or building a cutting edge for your business vis-a-vis -vis competition? Uh, so, of course, we look for what is the latest going around, but uh, uh, for me, it's always been, and for us, it's technology and enabler, okay? So technology, just for the sake of technology is not going to be of any use. So we need to see where it fits in with our, with our processes, our, uh, our environment at uh, uh, Expo. And uh, based on that, then we take calls. Also, of course, there is always, always the budgetary constraint that goes without saying, and uh, what we do is uh, see what is the best fit for us. We are constantly looking at new things, constantly look at the new technologies happening, seeing how we can 
test it out, or rather we do test it out, see whether it's helpful for us. Uh, like I said, the, the, the personnel who can actually use it, I mean, eventually is used by the people of the, the employees, the company, right? So you can't have something really um, high end, which is not going to be used at all. So that's a big challenge actually. Of, uh, Practical decide. technology. Sorry, pardon me? Practical technology is what's needed. Practical, yeah. It's, it's very important for us to have something which is absolutely practical. See, the thing about uh, forwarding. Uh, what happens is uh, in our industry, uh, traditionally, we have been very slow adopters to technology. The reason we have been slow adopters primarily is because the, the personnel, I'm not saying it's good or bad, the personnel they don't, uh, there's never too much of attrition. So people, if you find in, in forwarding companies traditionally, you know, they will be 15, 20, 25, 30 years in the company. And so we need to keep that in mind when we are deciding to uh, embark on any new technology in a big way. Until then we keep trying, trying, trying. And uh, as you said, technology is the differential factor between uh, uh, making it to the next level or just being where you are and uh, with your set of customers and keeping them happy. Yeah, that's that's very fair. Uh, uh, I would also assume that the last year and a half ever since COVID struck, it's been a huge catalyst for, for rapid adoption of technology because that's kind of been the differentiator for most organizations, right? Absolutely. While I will dwell a little bit uh, deeper in this subject on how technology has been adopted by you, I think I would like to start by saying, how did you manage to keep services operational, right? When everybody had to work from home. You yeah. said that as an industry, it's a very slow adopter of technology, which means that uh, uh, there could have been a scamper. You know, how are we going to manage this? There are so many people working, it's so fragmented, and there are so many things that you do. How, how did you manage the transition from, from working at office to work from home? Yeah. So, so with us, fortunately, uh, we have adopted the SaaS model, that is a software as a service model for all our applications. Oh. Believe it, uh, because we don't have any servers with us. Nothing? Nothing at all. Nothing at all. Legacies, legacy servers are there, but they are just kept to the side. Uh, but what we did is, uh, and this we did much before, not obviously no, no one knew about COVID, right? So then, but what we did is uh, we found great merit in cloud computing. And well, when I say cloud computing, primarily the SaaS model, wherein uh, it would be cloud computing for the software vendors. But what we felt is we saw great merit in that. Now, in our, like you mentioned earlier, traditionally, or we are, we are very, uh, we, have, we work on very thin margins. So wherever we can save on costs, we do that. Now, what we found is that instead of having our own in-house setup, in-house servers, in-house software, our software wasn't in-house initially, but it was on-premises on installations, uh, we would be needed or we had a large number of people for supporting it. Yeah. I mean, it's not just with uh, EFL, but in my previous organization also, I mean, we started doing that. Uh, in fact, many, many forwarders have begun, large, medium size and large forwarders have begun to do that. Uh, so what happens is uh, when you do a, a SaaS model, we don't need to keep any servers. We don't need to have dependability or any personnel. It is a service provided by the software vendor. It is his, uh, the, so the software vendor's problem uh, to ensure that Systems are up 365, 24 by 7. That is the, and that helped us enormously, enormously. Of course, there were compromises. So typically, uh, if I can just go back a few uh, decades, uh, like we said, we have uh, never been, uh, forwarders have never been uh, quick adopters of technology. Uh, so they used to be early, earlier, before the cloud came about and matured so much, there were various hundreds and many, as you said, many competition. Most competition had their own, uh, most, most uh, forwarders had their own software. There were very little, very little standardization that was happening. 
yeah. with all of this. But coming off the cloud, what happened is people, uh, vendors started using the SaaS, uh, SaaS model and developing softwares or they were already there. But they started uh, deploying softwares which were then given to uh, forwarders yeah. like us. What then happens is uh, one major chunk of investment goes away and expenses goes away. We don't need to have uh, infra. We don't need to have personnel to uh, look after the infra. The, basically, when I say infra, I mean the servers, etc. Even the storages, we don't need to worry about. So keeping that in mind, we moved all our applications to the cloud, but with, a, with each service provider. And it's that helped us beautifully in this uh, uh, in this uh, COVID during the COVID. The only problem there was on the workstation side. Exactly, the end user computing end. End user computing, absolutely. So when we thought when we found all these things happening, uh, we thought that we were ahead of the pack, and went and started looking for laptops. Yeah instead of uh, desktops. So this is also some, this is very interesting actually. So uh, maybe we'll come to that a little later, but what happened is moving to the SaaS model helped us enormously. So except for the end computing part, nothing else had to be worried about. We didn't have to be worried about anything else. It was virtually a seamless move. That's, that's perhaps unheard of in my experience at least that, you know, Everything is out on the cloud. You don't even have servers. It's not even a hybrid environment. Everything is managed by the SaaS provider. Uh, so obviously you are a big believer in the power of cloud, right? So I have a couple of questions related to this. You know, one is really when you look at what you want to adopt in the cloud world, right? With respect to your software or whatever else, you know, what are the key considerations that you have? You know, uh, what are the things you consider as success factors for this transition? So uh, first is, of course, security is very important. Okay. That's one of the reasons why adoption to the cloud, again, I will only focus from the logistics and the forwarding point of view, has been slow. Okay. Yeah. Because security, firstly, profit margins are low, competition is so high. If I put my data on the cloud, anyone can steal it. So yeah. that was one. Okay, So they, that was a, a one major consideration. Second uh, major consideration would be uh, performance. As in, if I go on the cloud, will I get the same performance that I get when I'm sitting in my, when with an on-prem? Uh, yeah. That was again a huge consideration. Will the uh, will 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 it, will there be lag time? Will it work? Another major consideration uh, when we're looking at cloud. Now again, uh, for us having these enterprise solutions is a very big deal because. Everything and anything and everything now works around these enterprise solutions. So whatever I'm telling you is with that in mind. Yeah. So then what happens is, uh, apart from the uh, apart from the performance, uh, the cost, right? So primary was consideration was security. Will my data be safe? Second is will my the will the performance be uh, hampered? Will it be slow? I press yeah. a button, I have to wait. It comes back. Third thing, as I said, uh, was uh, the cost. Now, how much would it cost me to actually use an application which is on the cloud? Oh, yeah. Now, the cost part is there. It is expensive. And still, that's why you have many, many, many large chunk of uh, operators, uh, forwarders, logistics providers who are still not gone in for the SaaS model because... Interesting. Cost of transactions, is it cost per transaction? Is it cost per user? It's still high. Yeah. And the ROI for that will take some time to come. And generally, uh, it's my belief that when you follow this kind of a cloud model, and especially for a SaaS model, if your business is not doing well, is not growing, it's it's a double bang. If your business is not doing well, the costs are going to be high. Yeah. If, it, if the transactions are high, generally you get bulk discounts. I mean, this is how it works, right? So. Uh, if you're really confident your business is going to be doing very well and really moving fast, the costs are actually come down because of uh, bulk transactions and uh, your investments are down and it's much better. So these were a few considerations uh, on our part. Yeah. Uh, these are the considerations I take into account. Yeah. So 
very 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 nice uh, you know then i say that because you know we all speak about security performance and cost right and often many times when we talk about cost we all know about security and performance right it's out there everybody knows about it i'll come back to the security point later but when you look at cost most people say we want to go to the cloud because you know it will save us cost yeah. it, it's 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 the myth it's the myth which is now getting blown away ever so slowly yeah no cloud means low cost and you said it rightly right that you know even though it is expensive and for me roi hence will take time and the business needs to do well how are you managing that increase in cost because you are working in a low profit industry yeah you have put in everything on the cloud you have hardly anybody uh, within i am assuming our infrastructure to manage this whole so, but at the same time cloud costs are burgeoning out of control yeah. how what is the how do you bring in optimization what are the things and factors you look at okay so one way to convince the management it's a first thing is i'm re- i'm reducing cost by removing the uh, infrastructure yeah so that cost is saved okay but on the other hand there are like you said burgeoning costs here the way is to bring about process uh, optimization one major area where uh, it's still a challenge uh, but uh, which has got great potential is bringing about process optimization yeah. within the entire process of operations uh, this then what happens is uh, having good having process optimize optimizing your process rather helps and typically you, you can do more more transactions or the more 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 business with the same number of people more shipments with the same number yeah. of people and that's the only way it works so don't increase your uh, employee strength but let let the business keep increasing and you do that by process optimization and there of course technology that's that's how we sell it and that is how uh, we find that uh, we will be able to uh, get some kind of an roi so what happens is uh, it's a little deeper than this uh, because say for example now when you move to the cloud it's just not moving to the cloud so like i said there were there were there are hundreds of softwares in this industry yeah and each software has its own quirks each software has its own set of processes uh-huh. typically softwares have been developed in this i can only talk about this industry so software has been developed keeping with one customer in mind so any small software company what they do they go to a customer they say okay we'll build it for you free you just tell us give us the know how the functional the functional knowledge etc so this is how it's been so there have been so many different different software going around now with coming of this the cloud and the saas model no softwares there are huge players there are big players software players who offer the service what that means is that there is a lot of standardization that comes in Hmm. so if i have this large uh, software vendor who provides me a good forwarding solution that software vendor would have uh, obviously implemented it in many places because of the number of customers that they have and what happens is you get the best practices happening and that works trust me okay it's just not theory where you have a large software and best practices happen but actually it works so even small players who can afford or who are willing to take the risk to put in to an saas model will get exposed to best practices best practices yeah. means process optimizations process optimization means i mean you become really efficient and so that's how we uh, that's how i would look at it and that's what we tell the management wonderful one vector of this is process optimization which you rightly pointed out that the other vector could be the technology optimization right you actually in the cloud there is a cost per seat perhaps that your user that you are giving and you know uh, at at often many times you will see that unless you are having a constant dialogue or you having someone to really look at how these costs are operating uh, what kind of virtual machine uh, i mean of course it's in a saas model so you're not really bothered about it but there could be certain technology discussion that you would having with your saas providers to bring that cost have there been any interesting episodes where you've been able to drive the value of this discussion and bring out cloud cost down uh not really honestly not really i tell you why uh, with with the uh, with the service provider no simply because it's 
your problem. You're, you're looking after the stuff. Okay, the only thing what we do is we negotiate for better prices. That's, because we don't really, the whole intention of a SaaS model is we don't even talk to the vendor, except for the cost. Fair. That's, fair. That's, that's how fair. we do it. That's fair. Uh, then, of course, I need to touch upon this very important subject of security. Now, I'm not going to really ask you what's the security landscape because, of course, as far as I understand it now, the security has been completely up to the SaaS provider. Right? He yes. is the one who looks after everything. Uh, you must have been in this model for at least for the last three, four years yes, on a complete. Yeah, model. well, it's now almost three years that we are completely shifted onto this. Yeah. Absolutely. Have there been any glitches, uh, any attacks? That has really bothered you? Or has this been completely watered? There have been uh, attacks, uh, very few, uh, very few and far between. But uh, there have been attacks. Uh, so, like the like uh, we have the uh, our enterprise solutions. Uh, we are on Office 365 on Azure straight. So, so there have been a few attacks there. Not not many to talk about. Fortunately, uh, nothing major to uh, actually. So what we do is, like I said, we have uh, even that on the sa uh, on the cloud, the uh, uh, antivirus and everything is on the cloud. So uh, fortunately, we have not had uh, too many attacks. What we have also done talking about security is uh, uh, we have focused a bit on the local DLP also. So okay. we uh, using the antivirus, we have disabled the uh, pen drives and the external devices also. Yeah. So. We are pretty well protected uh, touch wood as of now, and we have not had any major uh, ransomwares or anything coming up actually. That, that's great to know. It just talks about the power of using SaaS solutions because the last four years is a good enough time frame to really look at any kind of such attacks and the, the news is extremely positive on that front. So that's wonderful. Uh, you know, you spoke a lot about standardization uh, and in this industry where you're doing multiple things, heavy transactional load, right? And there are so much of papers moving all across. At least that's what, if I were to count myself as a layman, that's what I think about this whole industry. It's just like so many papers moving around, needs to be given at ports, consignments moving, give some document to the consignee. It's all documents, documents, documents. Right? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, have you really looked at a couple of things that I would like to bring out here? One, how do you automate some of those things, repetitive tasks that you can build some kind of a uh, an RPA solution around and use automation? And then second, of course, with the kind of data you have, you know, uh, has data analytics been something that you have really dug into? Absolutely. I, I, spot on. In fact, I, that seems to be the logical progression, doesn't it? Uh, yes. So we have begun to look at RPA. Uh, and like you rightly said, because uh, a lot of papers happen standardization is now happening. So what happens is it's easier to implement RPA solutions. Now RPA, what primarily RPA does is will reduce our data entry effort. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that uh, will uh, definitely, that's already, well, we just begun that process of RPA and uh, that I'm sure uh, will pay rich divisions because I can see the potential in that. So data entry reduces and uh, what also happens is uh, uh, we are we are also looking at uh, analytics. Also, now now that we have several years of data with our standardization happening, uh, analytics becomes a very important part in this entire process. And this is how technology actually helps in bringing the cost down. Absolutely. So we in technology we have no uh, ability to improve the top line because that's not in our hands. What we do have is to reduce the cost. And the way we think about it is uh, this through technology, by optimizing processes, by introducing things like RPA, by, well, analytics will, will what it does is it, it just puts you into the right direction. It just throws light uh, for the management to take more uh, informed decisions. Now, that's what we do, and that's what uh, we are into analytics in a very big way. Yeah, and you know what what does happen that is when you start optimizing processes, you love started building RPAs, which in in fact goes back and improves the efficiency and the accuracy. That has a very very big rub off effect on the overall business because that 
that bandwidth which gets released from those mundane tasks that have been doing by different functions can now get focused on really building a very, very strong business, right? So, you know, whilst you de definitely look at cost being a lever and how you can reduce cost by using technology, you know, efficiency does have a big play in making sure that business is well looked after, right? I'm sure that uh, that is happening. Absolutely. And, 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 and something that you said just now, accuracy. Accuracy is very important because one major factor is in any uh, inefficient process is mistakes made by the op by the operations by the operators data entry mistakes yeah and that any mistake made means you will do it again okay. right so it's, it's it's just increasing your time now with rpa coming in that will definitely reduce and like i said we've just begun uh, the journey on the rpa and uh, that i'm sure would be very very uh, useful uh, solution okay. for you. That's wonderful, Vinod. I'm going to ask you one last final question. And that final question is essentially on, we speak a lot about digital transformation. Now we've spoken about cloud, we spoke about automation, we spoke about data analytics. Uh, I would like to wrap up this session by taking your impressions of what you consider as digital transformation. What is the scope according to you? What are the success factors? And what's your vision of a digital transform organization? Well, Again, dig, uh, technology is for when I'm saying when you say digital transformation is technology. Technology is for the end user. End of the day, anything, any kind of technology that will help reduce efforts of the users. Any kind of automation. Now, for example, uh, when we have gone through this entire uh, COVID time, you know, one very important. Uh, uh, point that came up or one very important uh, genre of uh, softwares that came up was paperless. Uh, we couldn't go to work, right? So we had to do digital signatures. We had to do things uh, digitally. So then we had to actually implement a digital signature solution. So that, uh, uh, I mean, so to work or business had to keep moving, right? And so, when you're talking, when we talk about digital transformation, one major one for me would be a completely paperless. Now you yeah. just spoke about document page. Yeah. If it's completely paperless, it's one. One point which we didn't really touch upon is from the customer's point of view. If we only were focusing more on the process and uh, Absolutely. Uh, internal uh, processes and internal operations, the customer's point of view, it is one very uh, a big advantage uh, to any technology uh, implementer or a forward, a forwarder who implements good technology is visibility. Now, a customer always needs visibility. Now, there are many, this, the entire chain is, of a supply chain has got so many entities in it. Yeah. Now, everyone would want to know ahead of time what is their act or what is going to be their action on that one supply chain. So, Preempting information should be available. So digital transformation in such a way wherein every actor in the supply chain yeah. would know what's coming and be prepared for it. That yeah. is very important. And for and for us, I mean, every customer, all actors who are not forwarders would be the customer. So the customer should know uh, when the shipments are going to arrive. The shipper should know the the the, the orders that are placed. Uh, and the, the whole supply chain uh, link. So, like I said, paperless visibility for the end customer, and you know something very interesting that uh, again, what not many people uh, talk about is uh, workflow management. The workflow yeah. management, especially in this uh, during the COVID times, has is has played is such an important thing. Fortunately, in a couple of our applications, well three or four applications, we already have the workflow management. But workflow management in itself for all approvals, okay, for visibility, if all of that is available, then what happens is, that is, I feel that is also very important for digital transformation to the next level. So okay. I, don't need to, I don't need to actually physically go to the office. I don't need to pick up the phone. Everything can be done with me sitting on my workstation.
all my permissions, everything, everything, whatever approvals, etc. Everything comes with that. Yeah, yeah. So you said it right. In a nutshell, it's about how you can use that to create a great customer experience, right? That visibility that it creates is a differentiator that you will create because you know when you work with Expo Freights, you have absolute visibility from source to destination. That's how. That's that's the dream. So that's the dream. That's how. It's, Absolutely. That's how, it, that's how it creates a differentiation. And then, of course, how do you make the internal processes so efficient, the operational so efficiency? You know that you are able to cut down uh, on a lot of uh, uh, you know errors within the operations and bring in a lot of accuracy and make it so seamless that it's irrespective of where you are, work gets done and experience gets generated and and customer is wow, which results in in business, right? So. So that's what you kind of summarize. It's wonderful talking to you, Vinod. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Once again, you know, this whole piece about 100% SaaS, you know, building high levels of automation within your business and creating that great customer experience. I'm sure, you know, some of, the, you know, a lot of these things will go and make Expo Freights uh, a force to reckon with. And that top three will very soon become top five. That's our Thank vision. Very much. On behalf of CIO News and Crayon, on that happy note, uh, thank you so much for being with us. It was a pleasure talking with you. you know. Likewise, thank you for having me and thank you, uh, Kushbu, for organizing this. Yeah? Absolute pleasure, Vinod. Uh, thank you for sharing your journey uh, with us. Uh, thank you, Vikas, for moderating the whole session. Uh, pleasure to have you both. Thank you, Kushbu. Thank you, Vinod.